it's a pleasure and honor to be able to kind of introduce uh, this, uh, this panel. Uh, uh, we're going to kind of talk uh, about a lot of different things, but as I just wanted to say, as a medical student, uh, there's a lot of different discussions and kind of perspectives around IR in the field today. And sometimes it feels a little bit of a amorphous or ill-defined field. You know, there's uh, a lot of different talks uh, about maybe the clinician versus uh, a proceduralist uh, perspective on things. Uh, a lot of people talk about the IRDR split. A lot of people talk about turf wars. Um, and a lot of people think about what are the different types of practices that are available, uh, whether it be academia versus OBL versus private or independent practice. So there are a lot of things to keep in mind. And But thanks to uh, great leaders and speakers in the field today, such as yourselves and the panelists, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for medical students to kind of uh, pay attention and move forward with this. So uh, we're going to just do a brief introduction, and then we're going to let Dr. Kavi Dave will probably take over and uh, moderate this entire panel. So... Uh, the first, uh, so the moderator, Dr. Kavi Devapoli, he's an independent endovascular image guided surgeon. He uh, went to medical school at Case Western uh, University, and he finished his residency at UCSF, did a fellowship at UNC, and he's passionate and very involved with uh, BPH, fibroids, venous disease, and critical limb ischemia. And then next up, our panelists, our first panelist is going to be Dr. Chris Quiddle. He's a CEO of uh, Vascular and Interventional Partners. He did his medical school at University of Arizona um, in Phoenix, his residency at UIC, and his fellowship at Stanford. He is an OBL founder and operator, so he's um, currently the director of an IR simulation program at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. Our next panelist is going to be Dr. Frederick Johnson, Jr. He is a vascular intervention radiologist at uh, Vita Vita Vascular Surgery in Thomasville, Georgia. He did his medical school at the University of Arkansas, and he did a fellowship at the University of Illinois. And then we have Dr. William Julian. He is a vascular interventional physician and practice president at the South Florida Vascular Associates. He did his med school at Washington University um, School of Medicine in St. Louis, residency at University of Minnesota Medical Center, and fellowship at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute in Florida. His clinical focuses are peripheral arterial disease and arterial in interventions. And uh, our, our final panelist is going to be Dr. Brooke Spencer, who is the medical director and CEO of Minimal Invasive Procedure Specialist in Denver, Colorado. She went to med school at the University of Vermont, uh, did her residency at Duke, and did her fellowship at Mount Croc University of uh, Radiology. Uh, and she has a focus in pelvic venous disease and chronic pelvic pain in women. And I just want to say thank you. I know we had a last minute change uh, to get you on this panel. So thank you so much for being here. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. You Great. Can. Thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to all the students who helped put this together. Um, Zayim, that was an excellent talk before this. Um, Hopefully we can follow up and get you guys some, some good advice. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion about terminology and I just kind of want to start with just this concept of private practice. You know, students often hear about private practice, they hear about OBL. Um, and, you know, I think the big thing that I want to stress with this panel is this is really, I think what really constitutes the future of our field, which I think really is a surgical specialty. And everybody here practices in that fashion. And what I really want to do today is I want them to share their stories and discuss what they're passionate about, what their lives look like, and what some of the challenges were for them to get to this point. So let's, uh, let's start right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a series of questions. And if everybody on the panel, we, could, we can start with Dr. Julian and then work our way around. Um, go ahead and, you know, kind of Tell, tell us a little bit more about your practice, but basically what, what I'd like to hear from you is what does a typical week look like for you? What kind of patients are you treating? Um, how often are you operating? When are you seeing patients in clinic? And do you practice any diagnostic radiology? And if you don't, do you miss it? Let's start with Dr. Julian. Uh, well, good morning out in California, I'm in Florida. Uh, so I've been out 32 years, so I'm a little bit older than you guys. And I left radiology in 2001. It was a joyous occasion because I, I think the, the problem is diagnostic radiology has not, is couldn't be further from interventional radiology. Diagnostic radiology reads films, worries about RVUs, and interventional worries about patient care and surgical procedures. And so it, other than that distant vestigial link of imaging, 
the commonality, there's really nothing um, that's that's the same. So I I left in 2001 and made the difficult um, uh, process of getting on staff at a hospital, which is a totally different um, issue that we'll probably get into later. But I was able to get independent and open an office. When you're in a diagnostic radiology group, usually you're not allowed to open an office because that costs money. And of course, diagnostic radiologists, which are the majority voters in a practice, don't understand a clinical practice. So without an office, you're dead in the water. You're completely depending on whatever junk is left over in a hospital that other specialists don't want to do, and you end up doing those procedures. So if you want to get a good practice, you have to do all the heavy clinical lifting and see patients and have an office and you so that you have to basically go independent. There's very few diagnostic groups with IRs that will let you have an office. So you'll hear about some, but that's uncommon. So um, I opened the office in, in um, 2001, which is to me the ethical way to practice. And it's also how you get the patients. You'll notice that Everything that Kavi put on his initial slide, the procedures he do are common procedures. Half the half the patients, half the people in the world have either a prostate, they hundred percent have a prostate or or a uterus. So it's a very high volume procedure to do embolizations of those. Uh, same thing with vein disease and artery disease. You know, cancer disease, the only reason IRs do that is because they lost all the other business because they weren't doing the clinical work. And then probably the same thing will happen. And the volume is way smaller in cancer disease than these other things. So you need an office. You got to have a busy clinical practice. Um, I have 32 employees, three providers that work with me. Um, our run, office runs, we have three off, different offices, but the offices run every single day. We're doing consults, follow-ups. The only imaging I do is the vascular lab, uh, ultra, various ultrasounds, just like a vascular surgeon. Um, I'm only doing vascular disease. And so all the way I enjoyed the fiber comments on the diverticulitis and, um, it, I don't do any of the non-vascular work and, um, I never go to the hospital except about once a month on Fridays to do aneurysm repairs, but otherwise everything we do in the office, very sophisticated work, critical limb ischemia, superficial venous disease, um, all, all the embolization procedures that, that Kavi had mentioned and, um, we operate three days a week in the office, not counting vein disease, veins. We do superficial veins. We do, uh, one day a week, do like a lot. We have a record coming up on Tuesday. We're going to do 23 cases. Usually we do 18 to 20. And uh, the place home. So it's, that's the if you want to be a successful IR, you need to have an office and see patients. If you want to just make a good living and uh, read films and dabble in IR and do simple cases, you're going to probably make a good living. But it's not going to be what, what you the reason you probably wanted to go to IR to begin with. So I think I've said enough there, Kavi. I'll hand it off to someone else. Okay, how about Dr. Spencer? You wanna go ahead and tell us a little bit about what your professional life looks like and what you're passionate about? Sure, well, I'm a lot like Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Brooke. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a little while. Um, and uh, I um, also started in 2001. Bill was practicing a little before that, but that's when I started out. Um, and I started out in a large group that had... 13 interventionalists. And so we had a pretty busy hospital in practice, but every day that you were on an imaging rotation on IR, you were also expected to be reading a lot of films. So as I built a big clinical practice and they let me start an office or a clinic, it didn't work because if you are doing clinical work all day, you don't have time to be reading a head CT that's time sensitive in the emergency room. So I left that practice and joined a group in um, Colorado, which is a wonderful group and started a clinical practice there that was very, very busy, but only half the interventionalists went to clinic and half didn't. I increased volumes in our hospital by 250% in two years, and yet they didn't give me any extra help. So when I was there, I had to do all the work was that, that was there and my patients. And when anyone else was there, they just had to do the work that was there. So that didn't really work either. So I, I, um, I quit about six years ago and started my own practice. And I've gone through multiple iterations in that practice of having docs that specialized in spine and pain, arterial disease, cancer disease. And for me, it was just a little bit of a battle to keep everybody happy and figure it out. So the long story short is that I've been in venous disease my entire career, and um, I had licenses all over the country uh, because I do complex venous reconstructive work um, from 
other places that either fail or did it wrong or whatever. And that morphed into um, a whole female pelvic pain practice now where we're doing gonadal vein embolization, pelvic floor embolization, direct stick labial venography and foam sclerotherapy, um, fibroids. And then I still do complex DVT reconstructive work. And then we have a varicose vein clinic also. So we got rid of everything else. So we don't do arterial disease. We don't do prostates. We don't do geniculate artery embolization. For me, it's been nice because I don't have to compete with my old partners. They don't like to do the stuff I do. So I send them that stuff and keep what I do. And as a result, we, um, I have 44 licenses now and people coming from all over the country. I hired a full-time research coordinator and, um, we're going to start cranking out the data publishing studies. I started a nonprofit organization to raise money to pay for the research. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, over the next little while, I can be the Taco Bell to everybody else's uh, McDonald's and Burger Kings and, you know, open a bunch of them to get uh, better access to care for women across the country. Excellent. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, let's go to um, Dr. Johnson. Um, hopefully, um, I think audio video is working now. Um, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about your practice and what your focus is. And, and again, um, a discussion about a split between how often you're operating, how often you're in clinic, and any diagnostic radiology responsibilities. Thanks. Are you guys able to see my screen? I can see it, yep. All right, good deal. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to take part in the uh, panel. Uh, I've been in practice now for 10 years. I finished up in 2014. Initially, I uh, started out in a, in a group that sounds like it was pretty similar to Dr. Uh, Spencer's group. I was in a mixed DR IR group. Uh, and it was, it was a very productive IR practice in that we were doing all things IR, uh, things from EVAR all the way to stroke, to all the bread and butter. We did you know, women's health, uh, men's health. And it was a great practice. I was you know doing 90% IR in terms of the days of which I was practicing IR, but there was also that expectation that I was to read uh, studies in between as well. So there was a fair amount of diagnostic radiology. Uh, and about five years into it, uh, the, the DR portion of it just became uh, a little bit too much for me just because the IR practice was really growing. And so for that reason, I ended up uh, looking for other opportunities and I ended up in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, which is not Atlanta, Georgia. That's usually the immediate follow-up that I get when I tell people that I practice in Thomasville, Georgia. They say, oh, you live in Atlanta. Uh, we're actually 230 mi 30 miles uh, south of uh, Atlanta. And so now my practice is that we're a, we're a mixed sort of multidisciplinary uh, practice that consists of surgeons as well as IRs. So we have uh, three interventional radiologists and we have two surgeons. Uh, we have a thoracic surgeon and a general surgeon. And the general surgeon, he practices a lot of uh, vascular work and he does open vascular. So it really complements us well. The IRs, we do the endo work and he does the open work. So things like carotid endarterectomies, fem pops, fem fems. And so it's, it's really created just a, a very gratifying uh, practice. Uh, and so I do no diagnostic radiology. Uh, and that's, that's definitely uh, been beneficial uh, for me. Uh, on any given day, uh, usually we have three rotations. Either you're the on-call guy, which you're uh, at the hospital. We are primarily hospital-based, even though we do have our own office that we own and we do minor procedures. Uh, but on any given day, you're either at the hospital all day doing procedures um, or uh, you're the backup guy they're supporting uh, the call guy. Or the third rotation is that you're in clinic. And so we see patients every day uh, in our clinic. We're open Monday through Friday, eight to five, and, and we are seeing and evaluated, evaluating patients uh, pre-op and uh, post-op uh, as well. Uh, we do not have an OBL as of yet. Uh, but we are doing uh, procedures in our office. And there are things uh, like uh, superficial vein procedures, so great saphenous vein ablations, sclerotherapy, phlebectomy of, of varicose veins uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the breadth of our practice, we do essentially everything in IR with the exception of stroke. Uh, so we, we do EVARs, uh, we do PAD, uh, we're doing a lot of dialysis work, uh, interventional oncology, including ablations, Y90s, uh, chemo embolization. So it's a very, very broad practice, uh, including a lot of the bread and butter things, abscess drains, biopsies, uh, ports uh, as well. And so it, it's, 
it's been a very good move for me to move uh, to this small community. Is It's certainly a rural practice, and that's not for everyone, uh, but it, it works for me. And uh, one of the uh, benefits uh, to me and working in a rural community is that it, it's tons of opportunity. I mean, there's naturally you're going to be a little bit less competition in rural communities, and, and there are a lot of patients who need uh, who need our, our skill sets in these rural communities. Uh, and so I, I would certainly encourage a lot of the trainees to, to consider that as you get ready to get out into practice. Just realize that there are tons of opportunities in rural communities and there are a lot of patients that need your skill set. And, and you can pretty much just do mostly everything that you want to do in these settings just because you're not going to have a ton of competition here as well. Excellent. We appreciate that. Um, and I want to give the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Chris Gettle talk as well. Uh, let us know about your practice, kind of what you're doing. You have a pretty unique setup. Everybody here is unique in their own ways, but I'd uh, certainly love to hear about the model that you guys have out there in Phoenix. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks, Kavi, for the intro. And um, thanks to all the organizers for putting this together. I think as IR keeps evolving, these sorts of meetings are, are so valuable and so important. So hats off to all you guys for, for organizing a really, a really nice symposium. Um, so our, our practice, as Kavi mentioned, is a, a little bit uh, unique. So um, I'll spare the, the detailed story, but the short version is that we were employed IRs in a big hospital system. So we, right out of fellowship, I'm about six years out now, and I took my first job with a large hospital system in Arizona, which is called the Banner System. But we staffed um, their high acuity, you know, university level hospital there. It's about a 750 or 800 bed hospital. Um, so a lot, you know, a lot of high acuity stuff. We do stroke thrombectomy. We do tips. We do oncology, a lot of vascular disease. So your typical busy university setting. And about two years ago, uh, we made the decision to take our group private, which was a very interesting transition for, for all of us being, you know, W2 hospital employees that did exclusively 100% IR to then transition and form a private group. And we opened an OBL. Uh, we were able to contract with the hospital um, separately as a private group instead of as employed physicians. And we're now growing our group across Arizona. So we have uh, seven um, full-time IRs. Well, we're bringing on a neurosurgeon, um, kind of similar to Dr. Johnson's group. We're starting to, to enter into that multi-specialty model as well. Um, we have six APPs and then another maybe 10 or 12 support staff uh, in our company. So um, it's been a wild ride. It's been a lot of fun. But um, at the end of the day, if, if you love clinical IR, you know, it's, it's really a great way to practice. So I've been very, very lucky. You know, I, I, I may have missed it because I was probably typing. Sorry if I did, but do you, do you guys do any diagnostic work at all? No, oh, good question. Um, we, we do not. So we didn't in the hospital and we don't now. That's not something that, you know, we're, we're really excited about. Um, we obviously do it as part of our clinical practice and, and we evaluate patients with imaging every consult we do and we share their imaging. So um, we still absolutely believe in, in high level imaging evaluation, but as far as a, a dedicated DR practice, that's not something that we, we really feel is, is part of our group. Awesome. Thanks for that. You know, I just kind of want to touch on that briefly because when I interact with a lot of students, I, you know, I notice that a lot of them, you know, have this worry, they have this fear about potentially losing diagnostic skills. And I think it really pushes a lot of people to maybe want to consider doing that. And what's unique about, I think, those of us who are practicing longitudinally, like everybody here, is we don't necessarily see it the same way. So, you know, just real, real briefly, anybody who wants to chime in on this panel, how exactly does diagnostic imaging help you in what you do? And if you were a student looking to, you know, maybe follow in, in your current footsteps and, you know, be the next Julian, the next Spencer, the next Gettle, the next Johnson, you know, what would you tell them in terms of imaging training? Javi, I didn't answer your question about that. I don't do any diagnostic imaging myself either, except for like, Bill, we have a vascular lab and I'm sure everybody else does too. But one thing that's interesting is that in this model that we're expanding with patients across the country, I probably order about a hundred MRIs a month. 
Wow. So we're going to eventually get an MR scanner, but I will not be, nor will my partners be reading those MRIs. We will contract out to a diagnostic radiology group to read those MRIs because I have lost the skill and ability to look at, you know, a complex liver lesion, a pancreatic lesion, do whatever, but I simply don't have time. I mean, we're so busy taking care of the patients that we're taking care of and so overwhelmed with that care. But I will tell you this, we are going to be publishing an article about CT comparison to MR venography, to venogram, to intravascular ultrasound for iliac vein compression. And I will tell you that there is not a diagnostic radiologist in the country that reads these scans correctly in terms of the presence and locations of varicose veins in the pelvis. They don't, they don't see the collateral venous drainage pathways, but I can see it when I look at it. So the skill and ability to read these MRIs in a meaningful way as a radiologist has allowed me to identify problems that we've been missing for years, hopefully educate others and get them to start looking at it. But I know that my vascular surgery colleagues and some of my cardiology colleagues struggle to be able to interpret the imaging that has not been interpreted correctly by a diagnostic radiologist. And I think it's a huge advantage to being an IR. I think that's excellent. I, I think in many ways, this is no different than a subspecialty surgeon, right, who becomes an expert at the imaging that's relevant to the patients that they're treating. And I, I think that's key. I appreciate that insight. So I, I want to move on to talking about some of the challenges. And, you know, I, I think it's pretty amazing what you guys are doing. I think these are really exciting practices. You guys are treating a wide variety of conditions. You obviously enjoy doing it. You're sharing your experience on Super Bowl Sunday. Clearly you're passionate about it, but what kind of roadblocks did you face to get to this point? And let's, let's start with Dr. Julian. So the one that everybody's going to face is um, the one that we shouldn't be facing. And that is the diagnostic radiologist. So there's um, every hospital in the United States pretty much has a one contract with a radiology group. They call it exclusive, and it is pretty exclusive for imaging. But what's happened over the last 30 years is it's not exclusive for interventional. And so you've got many specialists doing interventional type procedures, for instance, neurosurgeons and neurologists doing uh, intracranial work, um, vascular surgeons, cardiologists doing all sorts of vascular disease, arteries, uh, pulmonary thrombectomies. Uh, Di nephrologists doing dialysis, ortho doing kypos, all sorts of things. So it's not even remotely exclusive, but if you as an independent IR apply to ho get hospital privileges, you'll be blocked. And in most places you're dead in the water because if without a hospital privileges, that's just a basic building block of a practice. You can't open an office interventional suite because um, you have to have hospital privileges. So that's the big barrier. I op I might have been the first guy in the United States to break one of those contracts in 2001 when I got on, but it was it was touch and go there, and I barely was able to do it and had to use a lot of money. And um, I uh, it was it's a bit of a story I'll tell another time, but it's very difficult to do. And so it's it's infuriating that your biggest obstacle is going to be the IRDR groups. So um, there's a lot of other issues that you have to learn how to, you know, hiring your people, HR, um, spending a, a big investment to get your office, building it out. There's a, there's a huge number of things, but, but one barrier that IR has, uh, specialties don't, is they can all just walk through the front door of a hospital and get on staff. And so that's a, that's a problem that, that, that hasn't been solved yet. How about anybody else? What, what other challenges, you know? The one that Dr. Julian's talking about is kind of the classic challenge. Um, have any of you else experienced that or other challenges that may be related or not related? Well, I'll, go ahead. I'll chime in. Uh, so for, for me, um, I, I have to admit, I, I sort of cheated a little bit in that my practice was already uh, pretty well established when I came in. And so uh, the challenges that Dr. Julian uh, had, they had already been fought uh, by the time that, that I had gotten here to Thomasville. And so I, I didn't really uh, say this initially, but with our practice, we have uh, what's called uh, a PSA or professional service agreement. And so uh, with this PSA or this professional service agreement, this is it's essentially a mechanism or a, a model uh, for two entities, those two entities being the physician practice, as well as the hospital or the healthcare organization to align themselves uh, to ultimately have a common goal. And that's, that's to take care of patients. 
And so we, that, that, that battle had already been uh, fought by my partners and they actually started this practice in 2007. And so the exclusivity issue had already been resolved uh, at that time. But we, we do have challenges uh, just, just like everyone else does. I'll say probably one of the bigger challenges right now, though I said there is less competition in rural communities that we do have competition. And so we, uh, while PAD is a large part of our practice, we are facing challenges from other specialties such as IC, uh, there's vascular uh, surgeons here in town. And so we have to, uh, we have to really uh, fight and, and remain relevant and provide good quality uh, in order for us to stay in the game uh, in terms of PAD and, and to continue to do endovascular work, which these days is somewhat of a rarity uh, in interventional radiologists. So, Kavi, if I could say one thing, um, the mm -hmm. with private equity buying a lot of the radiology groups, what that's done is they're forcing their interventional radiologists to read more films, do RVUs, do it between studies, and do less IR. Or And it's become very um, uh, unpleasant for a lot of them. And a lot of them are sort of abandoning those practices and really looking out. And so I think, I don't know Chris's backstory, but I would suspect in his city, there was a lot of, uh, and a lot of cities that it, coming up in the future there's less it's less easy to coverage ir cover ir at the hospitals and so there's going to be hospitals it may even be the turd hospital but you got to start somewhere there's going to be hospitals that need ir coverage and you can go especially in communities small communities i'm sorry rural places that don't have any ir coverage that's a perfect place for someone to go and say i'd like to have a contract the basis of surgical practices around the country is you you can't make a living off just professional fees. And so they'll have things, you get paid for call, you may get paid working in an ASC or an OBL. There's, it's not just professional fees. And so um, you if you can get a professional service agreement, like Fred talked about, and um, like sounds like Chris has, that would be great. And I think there's gonna be way more opportunities in the future. And if enough med students and residents and IRs also come down on the SIR, put pressure on the radiology groups that may also help to open up a lot of those doors. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's different everywhere you go also. Right. So, I mean, I was part of a big group and I split off the hospital gave me part of the service. Then the hospital decided they wanted one group to cover the service, but I'm still medical director of the department and I don't cover the service. I have full access to the hospital, but I don't have to cover the ER or the inpatient. I mean, that's a very unique situation that I've been able to arrange. But the reality is I think, I think that Bill like set the groundwork years ago and I think it's starting to sink in. I think the bottom line is no matter what you do, whether it's a hospital or your own practice, you have to bring a value proposition. So if you wanna be on the good side of the hospital administration, you need to let them know how much money you're gonna make them. So for me, for example, I've kept them happy because I do a lot of complex venous reconstructions that can only be done at the hospital. IV celiac reconstructions that take too much equipment and too much time. So while my partner's doing cases in the outpatient center one day a week, I go to the hospital and do these big cases. I make them about $20 million a year. They're not going to kick me out. And, you know, the other guys just got used to it. I mean, the reality is sometimes we're going to have to ruffle a few feathers, but I think over time with, uh, you know, with pointing out that these are not exclusive contracts. If they have a vascular surgeon doing arterial vascular work, how can they block an IR from doing the same thing, right? I mean, I think we're going to break through that barrier. And, you know, I think there's going to be more and more practices to join. I mean, I'm desperate to hire people. I plan on opening a hundred of these if it works out that all the data proves that we need to be doing more of this. You know, uh, you know I'm sure... Um, you know, some people branch out and open multiple practices. Some people just stick to their own practice. But, you know, there's definitely ways of, I mean, once you design a good model and you have the help, I mean, <clears throat> things can definitely be profitable and a great living and a great way to make a living. Bobby, if I could, can I piggyback on that? Please uh, go ahead. Yeah. About the, the value proposition of IR, that, that's very important to understand. And uh, what we as IRs have to realize and make others uh, understand is that we're a little bit different in other specialties uh, like nephrologists or cardiologists. Hospitals, they value those service lines because they put patients into hospitals. Now, we as IRs, we, we do put patients into hospitals, but where our value lies is that we get patients out of the hospital. 
and hospitals they they make money by bringing uh, patients in and to the hospital but they tend to lose money the longer those patients are in the hospital and that's where we really bring value uh, to the system is that we we decrease the length of stays and we do things that uh, in a way that's cheaper than others and we can do things faster as well the other uh, way that we bring value and this is actually said to me by a hospital administrator is that IR, our reach is so far. Uh, we touch so many different specialties and there are so many specialties that are that are what I consider IR dependent. Uh, and so even a lot of those mundane things like biopsies, um, because of that, onco oncologists, they're very dependent on the skill set that, that you will have. Those ports uh, that oncologists need, they, they're very dependent upon the IR for that. Even nephrology groups, those fistulograms and those D-clots, they, the nephrologists, they depend upon IRs for that. So I, I think we, you, you really have to understand and appreciate your reach uh, that you have. And, and it's really uh, incumbent upon hospital administrators to understand that the IR reach is very far and that we do bring a lot of value to hospital systems because of that. I think that's a great point. I think one thing I'll, I'll add on that is I think what makes this panel unique is, you know, for, for those of you with some hospital presence, you're absolutely doing that, but you're not pigeonholing yourself into that. And you're expanding services that are beyond that as well. And um, I'm, I'm curious, Chris, if you want to chime in a little bit based on what Fred said, which is absolutely spot on, um, you know, you guys maintain that hospital relationship, but you still have your own outpatient center. Can you kind of talk about some of those dynamics? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and honestly, that's, that's what I would call threading the needle. You know, that's kind of the holy grail, I think, for a young clinically focused IR coming out is how can you have a really healthy and productive hospital relationship and have an OBL and, and kind of make everything work at once. And so, you know, we were able to make that work for, for a lot of reasons. And some of them were luck and some of them were related to hard work, but um, Dr. Julian's point earlier about the exclusive contracts is a really important problem. And it's a really important barrier that's going to prevent people from doing what we've been able to do in this, this one unique circumstance. But in my opinion, you know, this is the model that everyone should be going to. It's, it's really the, the best way to practice IR, to be able to do high acuity cases in the hospital, take your patients to the right care setting, but also develop your clinical practice, you know, the way that you want to run it. And so um, that's what we've been able to do. But, you know, I, I think it's a little bit more luck and circumstance, and we really need to make that available to other young IRs across the country. So the, the only way that I can see that happening is, number one, you know, reform with the exclusive exclusivity of the contracts that Dr. Julian's done so much work on over the course of his career. And then the second piece is probably reimbursement reform too, you know, making sure that IR can survive at least a little bit more on the basis of professional fees so that hospitals don't have to subsidize, you know, with multi-million dollar stipends to cover call. You know, the, the more reimbursement we can get on the professional side, the more it'll decrease the burden of those contracts on the hospitals and it'll kind of open things up for everybody. So to me, those are the two biggest things that, that we need to push for from an advocacy standpoint to really allow our model to be operationalized across the country. I think those are excellent comments. And I think one thing I wanna add for the students um, to piggyback off of that is none of this could happen unless you're interested in it. I think that's the biggest issue that we've been facing with the culture of interventional radiology to present day is we have people in our field who are doing excellent, excellent clinical work and you're, you're seeing four of them right here and they're absolutely killing it and they're wonderful models of what we could be doing at scale. But there aren't more people doing this because it's difficult, but not only is it difficult, but there aren't enough people interested right now. You have to express that interest in everything you've been hearing about at WCVIS with respect to a clinically focused training mentality where you're developing disease state expertise, that's where it all starts. If you don't have that foundation, then you can't dive into the weeds and talk about all these things like finances and politics and exclusivity, all these very important issues. So I kind of wanted to put that in context. Um, I wanted to take a step back. I know we we're probably have about 10 minutes or less. Um, I wanted to address a few of the questions um, in the chat panel. And this is very interesting because this is kind of 
pertinent uh, given the fact that you know everybody here is is an independent um, vascular interventional radiologist, whether that's hospital or mixed or whatnot. How do you fight bias uh, from financial pressure, especially in a fee for service environment? How do you how do you kind of ethically morally deal with that reality where you know the more you do, the more you get paid, right? And that's kind of how we live right now. How do you balance that when you are the one in charge of your practice making the decisions? Bill, if you want to start. Well, this is not unique to what we do. This is every single, most every, I mean, maybe a diagnostic radiologist is sitting and reading whatever the computer throws at him. But in most cases, you're, um, you have a surgical mentality. People walk through your door and you do it, you do evaluate them, do what's ethically correct. Now, there are many unscrupulous, maybe not a high percentage, but you hear about them, uh, people who will do things purely for financial. And I think that's, this is just part of, you got to have good ethics. You got to have good training. Um, we could probably use some more oversight, um, having more, you know, practice guidelines. There's been some folks out there that have gotten in trouble deservedly, but um, I, I think, for instance, you'll hear about people treating claudication aggressively when maybe they haven't tried exercise trials or, or they haven't, you know, haven't stopped smoking or trying celestazole or trying different things, conservative treatments. Um, I mostly treat critical limb ischemia when patients' legs depend on it, but we do some claudication and it's a struggle with, I think any procedure we do, we're going to have these ethical struggles. So I, I don't, um, uh, I don't, I think it's something you can work through, especially if you've had good training and you're a good person. And it's something that I think we'll, we'll just, uh, you know, keep talking about. That's great. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. In, in our practice, you know, it's a choice, right? To be ethical is a choice and we should all make it, right? There's some people who won't, but we should all make it. And integrity, the definition of integrity is, you know, doing what's right in the face of adversity. We should all be acting with integrity and be able to sleep with yourself at night. And I'll tell you, if you become very good at something, anything, whatever it is you choose to do when you, if you subspecialize, right? Um, in my practice, I've created standard operating procedures for everything we do based on evidence-based medicine. We have it written out from start to finish from when the patient comes into the practice to how we work them up to what the timelines is for a follow-up so that it's consistent care. I have four nurse practitioners and three doctors. We all do everything exactly the same. Obviously the technical portion of a procedure is determined by the physician treating the patient. Everything else is the same. Every time on every patient, the decision tree is the same. And so my hope is that I can replicate that model and be able to give people the same high level of care that our practice reputation has received like across the country. And so I feel like if you do that in your community and you provide a high level of care and you're not pushing patients to have procedures, you're telling them what the criteria are, you fit them into the correct boxes and you do it, you'll be successful if, <clears throat> if you're unethical and you start doing procedures that are unnecessary and you're pushed to do it because of money, you know, you're going to end up out of the out of the game. You know, if things get bad enough, it may, doctors in general don't like to tattle on people or, or report them, but things can get bad enough in your community or somewhere you may see someone doing something. There's things, you have recourse, there's things you could do, you report them to the state, maybe a local hospital, or in some cases, like the Department of Justice. And there's a recent case out West where a huge uh, group of folks not really practicing like they should have were shut down. So um, I think you have to be doing some bad stuff for that to happen, but there's, there's different things that could be done. Yeah. And I can speak a little to that because that, that went down in our home market. So we've kind of had a front row seat to some of those bad actors that, that are out there in the community, but to go back to what Dr. Spencer said just just a few minutes ago, that's absolutely the key to just being evidence based. You know, use the evidence available and make ethical, sound treatment decisions. And if you do that, your volume is going to grow. You know, you're going to get referrals. You're going to be able to market successfully to patients. You're going to have incredibly thrilled patients that leave reviews and tell their friends about the quality of care they got at your facility. So, I think if you just play the long game and do it right you know, like all the other panelists have said, um, then it's a really great way to be successful and sleep really well at night too. 
all, all very good points that, uh, that have been made and I agree with that. Uh, it first and foremost comes down to just personal accountability. Uh, but also uh, it, there's really a lot that has to be said about having good partners. And so one thing with my partners and I, we hold each other accountable. So we're not only accountable to ourselves, but we're accountable to, to our partners, which overall re, uh, has a reflection on our practice uh, as well. Uh, and so I, I don't think it can be understated that to ensure that you're, you're in practice with good people uh, who do the right thing. And that'll also help to ensure that, that you're, doing, you're doing the right thing. And the other thing is when you live in a small community like mine in a rural community, you've got to keep your nose clean. Uh, just because people will find out pretty quickly if you're doing things that are nefarious as well. So that that really helps me here in the rural community, just understanding that I'm, I'm under a microscope a little bit and that I have to be above the fray at all times. I think all OBL owners are under a microscope now. And I think, I think, you know, I think it is a good idea to have some sort of like whatever it is, research going on if you're doing something that's on the edge you know, uh, making sure that you're like following that carefully, giving quality of life surveys before and after for patient reported outcomes built into your EMR so that you can demonstrate that this isn't just your subjective view of whether the patient's better or not, they're showing they're better. You know, just demonstrating these patterns of behavior that demonstrate integrity are important to establish in a practice. Excellent, those are, those are great thoughts. We have a few questions um, that have been coming in, some really good ones. So I, I want to make sure I'm not ignoring them. This this one just got posted. If you guys had one piece of advice for a fresh grad going to the OBL space, what would it be? Find the right partners. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think you have to. You just can't hop out and open an OBL, like the field of dreams to be successful. You've got to have, you have to be technically good. You have to have a pay, a following. Um, so you may want to join someone and you want to make sure that person's ethical and, and, you know, moderately busy. They can, even if you don't stay there forever, at least you'll have the building blocks. Uh, but what you don't want to do is just open a place. You'll be, you'll be dead in the water and bankrupt before you start. You got to have a busy clinical practice and then you can open a place and, and thrive. And I think it's important to recognize that the people that have put in the time and the work and the energy to build these, you know, they're going to be willing to hire you, right? But but recognize if you're straight out of training, like accept a lower salary, which exists in all diagnostic groups as well for a year or two, because you're going to take some extra work and care and time and, you know, get in that revenue generation space where you're making a lot of money in the outpatient centers, like when you're able to be that efficient and that effective in doing that too, right? So I've seen a lot of people come out and take a job where they're getting paid a half a million dollars a year their first year straight out of training, yet they went into a group where the podiatrists are pushing them every day to do inappropriate arterial interventions in order to generate their revenue. And then the next year, they don't understand that that salary is not guaranteed anymore and their salary is going to go down to nothing, right? So maybe find try to find some sort of a mentor to help you look at your contract and see whether what you're being offered is fair on both sides, but be realistic about what your value proposition is your first year out of training, which is not your value proposition. Your first year out of training is not the same as five years out of training. Excellent yeah. point. Go ahead, one, Chris. One piece of advice I got kind of early from one of my senior mentors was to think about it like a marriage. You know, if whatever job you take out of training, think of it in the same way that you would make the decision of whether or not to, to marry your spouse, you know, and it, it's that important and it impacts your life in, in all kinds of ways. But um, agree with the other panelists that who you go into practice with, you know, like Dr. Johnson's group seems like a really cohesive and ethical group and they make each other better. Th that's what you want. You know, you want partners that can teach you things up your level of, of procedural skills. Um, and then to Dr. Julian's point, I, I would not recommend right out of training going into an OBL setting. I mean, maybe as sort of the second physician, if you can bounce cases off a senior partner, that might be okay. But in our practice, we prefer to hire um, new grads into the hospital practice, really give them a high volume of really complex cases for a couple of years. And then when they're ready, you know, then plug them into the OBL. So um, that's what I would advocate for, for most people coming out of training. And then for uh, Fred, I know, you know, you're, you're in a hospital setting, but functionally, you guys do a lot of 
the same work that could be done in OBL. It's just specific to your community. It just happens to be a hospital. I, I, I'm sure, you know, the advice would be similar. What, what advice would you have for, I guess, an aggressive young graduate who's looking to, you know, practice like you do? Yeah. And so we, we don't have an OBO yet. Again, we are definitely starting to, to look into that space. Uh, but in terms of, of opening up an OBO, I think that one, we have to become polished. Uh, and so as, as uh, Chris uh, mentioned, uh, we definitely want to you know, get a lot of cases under your belt early on, uh, glean the, the experience and advice of more uh, senior partners as well, because once you get out into the uh, OBL space, um, you're a little, little bit of an island uh, by yourself. And so you're, you're not going to always have the uh, facilities or the expertise of, of non-radiology uh, specialists, such as ICU attendings and, and nephrologists uh, available to you. So I think you, you definitely want to get experience before you, you jump out into the, into the OBL space and make sure that that you're polished from uh, just a technical uh, standpoint and know how to get out of trouble uh, in certain situations as well. You know, I'd say yeah. when um, I, you like, you know, you might go as you get older, you might go a year without a big complication and you might think, well, I'm getting pretty good. I never have complications, but it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. You will always have a complication. I think the difference is you're better at predicting them, preventing from happening and you know how to handle them. And you see them coming on, and so um, there's the, the the you have to have experience, and um, um, I agree with all the other comments. Excellent. I'll say my personal experience. Um, I I was in a hospital for a couple of years before I I made that leap, and um, I I think it would have been a huge mistake for me to have done it right away. And uh, I think I I echo that. And you know everyone's going to come out, especially now with improved training pathways. And, you know trainees who are more clinically focused. I didn't necessarily have that. I had to still learning that. Um, I think maybe it'd be a little easier, but I, I think in general, I, I agree with all the comments that have been mentioned. I would echo that. I wouldn't necessarily look to do this pure OBLs, kind of this holy grail immediately out of training. Um, I want to move on and, and kind of talk about a couple themes and some of the questions that have been coming up, but there was, there was one in particular that I think was really fascinating. You know, we're all, you know, in, in the private sector here, private practice. And the question is, do you, do you face challenges from healthcare systems and hospitals? And I think really kind of how I want to frame this is, do you, do you guys worry about the future of private practice? I think there's, there's all sorts of doom and gloom. I think 2022 was the first year in, in history where the number of employed physicians was greater than the number of physicians in private practice. And that number seems to keep going down. So I, I kind of wanted to get some thoughts about that, especially in the context of our specialty. Um, Dr. Spencer, I saw you shaking your head. So why don't we start with you? Well, I don't worry about it because I have a great relationship with the hospital and with lots of people in the community. And the bottom line is that if, if reimbursements change or something change that is out of my control and my model doesn't work anymore, the hospital will buy our practice in five seconds. I mean, that there's never only one answer, right? Like I never want to go there and I'm planning on trying to do this, but I, you know, partnering with a hospital is, is always an option. I don't want to do it right now and I don't have to do it right now, but I might, you know, 20 years from now, we might not have a choice. Maybe all the rules change, all the reimbursement changes. But if you have a good, solid clinical practice, you will always be able to make a good living and give good medical care. I, I don't think that that, I don't think you're pigeonholing yourself into a place where you're not going to have a job anymore. I think I'll probably have a, a little less concern about uh, private practice positions. Um, so with the PSA of a professional service agreement, Sort of the basic premise of that is that there are two entities that need something. That means the physician group needs something as well as the hospital or the healthcare organization that needs something as well. And I don't think that will ever change. And simply because the healthcare organization, because they need the services uh, that we provide, I think there will always be a value that they will place on that. And, and that's the beauty of the, the PSA as compared to an employee model is that there? It, it's more mutually beneficial as if it's a symbiotic relationship as opposed to a parasitic uh, relationship. 
And so I, I, I don't think that there will be, uh, you know, there's not much concern on my end as far as the continued viability of private practice physicians. Uh, again, I think probably the ideal uh, model is going to be what Dr. Gatto has, in, in which there's a there's a hospital-based uh, uh, portion of your practice, but there's also an outpatient uh, element to your practice as well. So I, I think we'll be fine. I, you know, I, I don't think that as you young budding IRs will have much to be concerned about. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in and say I agree agree with those points 100%. You know, I'm not overly worried about private practice aside from maybe the reimbursement issues that Dr. Spencer mentioned. As, as long as we have reasonable reimbursement, I think practices like ours will, will be fine, you know, as long as we provide high-level care. I think it is worth mentioning that the private equity model and the influence that that has had on private practice in the United States has been a massive. It, it's been incredible how how quickly that happened. And it's important to note that that's not going very well. So in most markets, and that's not to say that every private equity owned group is bad or not working well or no, nothing like that, but as a general rule, private equity and radiology and specifically to IR has not gone well. So the practices around our uh, metropolitan area that are hybrid IR, DR groups that are PE owned, they've all de-emphasized IR to a really notable degree so that patients in these outlying hospitals can't get the basic IR care they need. And so those patients get transferred to our hospital so that we can care for them. So I think the Cliff's Notes from where I'm sitting and kind of our front row seat to private equity and IR is that it's not going well. And I think that means there's a period of opportunity coming down the pike right now for groups like ours, like all the panelists have if you're providing good care, I think there's an opportunity to step into that vacuum that um, some of these private equity groups are going to leave behind in the next couple of years. I agree with that 100%. Um, I think a lot of people are maybe perhaps running away from private practice. I'm personally running towards it very fast. And I, you know, everybody here has been in the private arena doing great things. And I think one thing I, I want to piggyback on Chris's comments and Fred's comments is that when we think about IR, we think about not just IR, IR is IR, but we're talking about endovascular image guided surgery. We're talking about something that the vast majority of current quote unquote IRs aren't even doing. All right. We're talking about advanced minimally invasive treatments for very common conditions. If you talk to a hospital administrator or a private equity guy, most of them are not going to even know about these types of practice patterns, the ones that you were hearing about at WCVIS. We have significant potential to impact so many different patients. And I think the ones who are, you know, really focus on what they love doing and taking care of those patients longitudinally will find a way to make it work. And I think that's what everybody on this panel has done. I don't think that's gonna necessarily change. We may have to get more creative about how we do it based on reimbursement, certainly, but it's healthcare, it's a moving target. And I, I would encourage any anyone who wants to do it, you can do it. Just know that there's headwinds and you have to be flexible. Um, let's see, I think we have a few minutes left. Um, so earlier there was a question about marketing and, and that's really important. And I, I wanna touch on this because there's often this perception, especially among you know, academic IRs or maybe traditional you know, diagnostic and interventional radiologists where are you gonna get the patients? There's this belief that there's a fixed pool of patients that you're in a hospital, you just do what's on the board and whatever you do, no matter how complex it is, may be dependent on the other surgical subspecialists or the size of the hospital or transfer patterns, et cetera, right? But I, you know, is that really the case? And, and is it possible to, to do this in places that aren't large population centers? And I wanna start with that. Let's talk about the rural part of it. So you know, Dr. Fred Johnson is, is in a small community. If you, if you look up Thomasville, Georgia on a map, you'll see, um, but here he is doing great things. So Fred, you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So there, we, we certainly have to put in the work, uh, just because we're in the small community doesn't mean that all things are, are coming to us. That is, that is certainly not the case at all. So there's a lot of still practice building, uh, that, that happens with, with us. We're out, uh, we're in physician offices and, and one, letting them know what we do, uh, reminding them a lot of times uh, of the things uh, that we do as well. 
Uh, so it's it's a lot of just getting in front of the faces of referring providers. Um, also going just to different uh, uh, healthcare organizations as well. We've about two years ago actually got a, a second contract with the hospital. It's about 30 miles away from us just because we let them know what we can provide uh, to them. So we're now provi providing interventional radiology uh, services uh, to them. Uh, we do marketing. There's no, no doubt about that. We, we do marketing uh, as well. It, it, it helps. You know, I'm not so sure if it helps maybe to the degree that it will in a Denver or, or a, a South Florida uh, as well. But we certainly uh, do marketing. We do social media. Uh, we, for a while, we were actually running commercials on the local airways. Uh, we didn't find that that, that really stuck uh, a whole lot. Uh, but for us, uh, it's been more so just getting out into the office and getting in front of the faces of, of providers and, and just reminding them what we can do and, and telling them what we can do. Because a lot of times, people just don't know what IR can do. Uh, and they're very surprised to learn that, oh, you, you guys do uh, chiroplasties also? Or, or, you know, you guys are treating fibroids as well? I think this, it's very important just to do marketing that way uh, as well, just the face-to-face -face, uh, marketing. So Kavi, I have a couple of comments on marketing. It, I used to think that when I grew old, uh, grow old, I was going to have people bring turkeys and and the place would just be flooded with apple pie and and patience and this and that. But it turns out it's you can never stop. We have two full time marketers. Um, I have competitor, lots of competitors. You know, two of my proteges are in town and they'd love to cut off King Arthur's head. And there's other surgeons coming to town. There's just millions of people. And there's also other specialists who do competitive things like the gynecologist doing hysterectomies instead of us doing uterine embolizations. And the you have to sell yourself with the urologist. So it's it's actually a big story. There's, there's a full uh, session going to be at OEIS if people want to come. Um, and the... Um, um, it, it's actually kind of fun. I do a lot of dinners one-on-one -on -one. that's real effective. Uh, but you can, you can never stop. You do outreach to podiatrists. Uh, my son is a movie director. He's flying in a couple of weeks. He's going to do a commercial, uh, for the, uh, prostate embolization. And, you know, so it's kind of a, a different part of the practice. That's, that's fun. It's a lot of work, but, um, it gets you, it gets you very involved in the community. Yeah, we have a full time we have a full time marketing company that works for us. We pay for them to manage my social media experience and reputation because I don't even know. I mean, there's so many mentions on Facebook groups and everything. Somebody needs to watch this stuff for you. They need to watch your Google ads and all this stuff. I'm old as hell. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. So they take care of all that search engine optimization for your website so that when people are searching keywords like uterine artery, you know, fibroids that you pop up first. I mean, you've got I mean, if. You want to get into a practice where it's it's successful enough that someone's doing that work for you. And then we also have a full-time boots on the ground uh, physician liaison who goes out into the pelvic floor physical therapy offices and tells them about what we do. GYN sets up dinners that are sometimes sponsored as an educational event from industry or something where 20 or 30 different providers come from the community and we sit down and educate them on the stuff that we're doing. It's all it's all pretty effective, but you're right. Bill is absolutely correct. It's constant and continuous and a lifelong proposition. It's not something you do once and then can stop. Yeah, those are, those are excellent comments. I, I think, you know, uh, it's, you, you can never, you can never rest. It's, it's an engine that you just have to keep doing, you know, um, you can be in practice for decades and you're still going to be doing referral dinners. You're still going to be doing outreach. And I think for students on this call, if, if you're of the mindset that maybe you don't want to be doing that, maybe you just want to do whatever kind of shows up, then don't do this. <laughs> That's just the frank advice. Just don't do this. This is, you have to be in it to win it, very passionate about it. And uh, you got to keep that engine going. So those are great comments. I think we might have time for one more quick question here. Um, I see, how do you navigate insurance reimbursement slash contract negotiation denials and different issues associated with the revenue cycle side of healthcare? It's a pretty, that's a, that's a really good question. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Very meaty. I don't know if we could answer that well, within I mean, a the, couple of minutes, but the, the quick try answer hardest. is you have to know the rules. The quick answer is you must know the rules. So when you dictate your report, you better put the right words in there. 
And when you pre-authorize your procedures, you better have the right words in there and you've better done, have done whatever it takes to do beforehand to be allowed to do that procedure or you'll get denials. If you don't, you'll get, we have almost no denials. So, I mean, it's all about knowing the right language, following the rules. If someone doesn't meet insurance criteria, don't try to push it through. Yeah, well, that takes a lot of experience. It's more its more than just the little 30-second summary. That You're hearing Brooke talk, give you, give you a couple decades worth of experience in that little, that little snippet. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's something you just can't answer too easily. No, you have to have pre-authorization specialists who know this stuff for you and send stuff back before they send it in. If you didn't do it right, you've got to have billers and coders that know which ICD-10 codes have to be linked. You can go into your EMR and you can create favorites. You can create templates so that everybody that joins your practice is forced to put the appropriate information into their notes. We've spent six years building out our EMR. It's very sophisticated now, but it was a disaster when we started. Yeah, I, I agree with all those comments. And, and one thing I wanted to say to piggyback on that is, is that the insurance and reimbursement and auth aspect can be a barrier for sure to opening, especially OBL, but it can also be a competitive advantage. So some of these things do require, you know, many years of experience and or a lot of time invested in your insurance contracting and getting carve out codes. So for example, I'll give an example. Um, a clinical case from our practice, we really spent a lot of time on Y90 radio embolization in our insurance contracting process and understanding all the rules about how that works in the outpatient space. And what we found is that there's so few physicians that take the time to do that right and to get, get it to a place where you can be authorized and really treat patients and get reimbursed for the dose that we're really the only ones doing it. I mean, very few people can figure it out. So if you do take that time and really learn the rules and do it the right way, um, it can also be a competitive advantage. Yeah, we have lists all over, like all the nurse practitioners and in our intranet SharePoint of what the insurance requirements are for each insurance company based on what size the saphenous vein has to be, how long they have to wear compression, whatever. We have spreadsheets of this stuff all over in everybody's office. And you just look up and you answer the question whether this person meets criteria. And if they don't, don't pretend. Just don't pretend you're going to get yourself in trouble. If somebody comes in and audits, you pay back millions of dollars and lose your ability to help all the people who do meet criteria. You just have to you just have to live by the rules of the insurance companies. And, you know, a more sophisticated thing, which is far beyond maybe this audience is, you know, we're going to go to our insurance companies and show them they now are required, at least in Colorado, to report what they're paying in different sites of service. So we're going to be able to go to them and say our site of service is so much less expensive than an ambulatory surgery center or a hospital. You really ought to, you know, pay us more to be able to do this, which is still much less than those other sites of service. And we'll see if we can make it work because we're in the process of doing that now. Excellent. Um, well, we'll wrap things up here. I, I think let's just go around real quickly. If you just have any parting words of advice, wisdom, nuggets for those watching, um, go ahead and, and say what you got. Let's start with Dr. Julian. No room for dabblers. If you want to be a successful IR, you got to be clinically oriented and quite driven. Uh, and I think if uh, you could help the cause, talk to your attendings and SI people in the SIR, tell them this uh, pseudo exclusive is a big problem. Also, if you want, if you're interviewing for residencies and you want to impress your the people you're interviewing with after they show you their fancy flat panel uh machine and and uh, maybe there are some fancy micro catheters you should say what i'm really interested in is seeing your clinic and how many days i'll be spending in your clinic let's march down the hall and see that i'm done how about dr spencer i was answering something was this the last words of wisdom words of wisdom yeah i mean here's the thing there the, the whole system's broken so pick a way you want to fix it and fix it. Find something you love to do and do it well. You will be successful, but you have to be willing to put the time in. If you don't want to put the time in and you don't want to go out and build relationships and talk to the docs and spend time talking to the patients and actually doing the consults correctly, it's not the right 
it's not the right place for you, but if you want to, you can be successful and I wouldn't worry about it. And I told my mom when I started this, she was freaking out, right? I said, what is the worst case scenario? I live in America as a doctor. I go bankrupt, lose everything but my retirement and have to go back to work as a doctor for a hospital or a big group. I mean, there really is no risk when you're early in your career. Go try it. If it fails, there's such a massive shortage of doctors right now. You can go get another job in five seconds. Yeah. How about how about uh, Dr. Johnson? Why don't you go ahead and yes. give some advice? In my the future of IR, it is bright. It is very bright. And I know it, it may sound like it's a buzzword or a buzz phrase to talk about clinical IR, but we are very serious about that. You have to be clinical. Uh, do not allow anyone to order you to do anything. You're a clinician and you evaluate patients and you evaluate whether or not a patient needs what's being uh, requested of you. So my advice is just to be very, very clinical, be willing to see patients, be willing to sit down with patients in your office and talk with them and, and figure out what needs to be done. That's the only way I think that we as I are going to be able to remain uh, relevant is that we have to remain clinical and clinically relevant. Excellent. And Dr. Gettle. Yeah, not, not too much more to add over the, the comments already made. I mean, that, that was perfect. Um, I would just say that, that this is a really good time to be going into IR. You know, the, it's split off into its own specialty for all the medical students and residents interested in it now. You're, you're really positioned at such an exciting and wonderful time. So if you can do that gut check and you know that you want to be a clinical IR and you want to do IR full time, um, if you have the passion, the, the sky's the limit. It's really a, an exciting time for all of us, I think. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate um, all four of you joining us today and our organizers for giving us this opportunity. Um, you know, please uh, enter your contact information if you'd like in the chat box. I think there's going to be plenty of students who are going to want to reach out to you all. Um, I think in many ways, we're, we're kind of living a future here at WCVIS. We're a field that's in flux. It makes it exciting. And uh, I think it also makes it challenging. But I think there is there is a bright future ahead. So um, with that, I guess we'll wrap it up.